fake laugh in three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Daily Wire Backstage Live. What's in the news? There is a dark psychic force that has taken over the news cycle, <laughs> and it has also given us the possibility of our next president, Marianne Williamson. <laughs> yeah. The Orb Gang. I know. She's great. She's I great. Like to think, I like to think that this is testimony to the greatness of our president, that he has ended news. He's yeah. just gotten so much right. That he didn't yeah. destroy the fake yeah, news gonna, media. He destroyed the yeah. media. I know, that's, that's, Guys, I know yeah. Ben thinks that. That's yeah, before you go too far in this direction, I hate to break it to you, but oh. the president basically decided that we're going to war with Greenland. <laughs> and it's about damn time. Ben, those poor oppressed people in Greenland, they can't own their own real estate. They are, they are oppressed by a, a Danish tyranny. We need shock and awe. We need boots on the ground. And we need to make... Greenland great again. <laughs> it's what the people want. I'll admit it wasn't what I was seeing when President Trump was elected. It's, the, it's a fight over Greenland. I mean, there, there are certain things that were unexpected. I also wasn't expecting the second coming. It didn't come the way I thought it would. I'll but be you're honest. The only I didn't one think it was the, coming at you're all. You're the only one on the panel you, who wasn't expecting the second yeah. coming. But right. I'll admit that we were all a little shocked at the form. I mean, this was more like the Spanish Inquisition. Nobody expected Nobody. it. Right? This is, this is, like, when you figure, like, you, look, it's, it's your religion. Okay, but when, when you, but if you're going to talk about, you know, Jesus coming back, I figured he wasn't going to come back in this particular form. Yeah. It was like, it's like Ghostbusters. I, yeah. It, we just imagine the form of our Redeemer. I mean, did, what, what was it? Was he like, they turned me down thrice, so next time I'm coming back and grabbing him by the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think he got the uh, before the cock crew. Like, I don't think he knew exactly. I don't even want to go down that road. I can't even imagine. You know, you will never know the day or the hour, and this accounts for that. I, I do want to talk about this because while it's an absolutely hilarious issue, I'm not sure that it's an, un, an inconsequential issue. The, the president... If you look at the field and you're sitting where I'm sitting, I think that he has an above average chance of holding on to the White House uh, in the 2020 election. When you say above average, do you mean above the average incumbent or just like better than 50 percent? Better than 50 percent. But where, I, where nah. I struggle to think about his chances are uh, when he says things like, I'm the second coming of God and, <laughs> and the king of the Jews. <laughs> uh, it, it strikes me that, that part, the president's a blunt instrument. And the very same things that give him his power also are his greatest weakness. And I, I actually think that's probably true of all of us, that usually your greatest strength and your Achilles heel are located in the exact same, uh, in the exact same spot, right? But the president has this, this amazing ability to go above the media, go past the media, use his Twitter account to speak directly to the people, and not just to speak a, a message about policy to the people, but he's able to use the kind of bombastic sense of humor that he has to really decide what the media is going to talk about. And this serves him very well. But it also comes with a real liability, which is he's not particularly disciplined about it. <laughs> I, I, you think? I, yeah. Oh. I, yeah. I worry that if the president goes around uh, you know, basically offending Jews and Christians with the exact same tweet, that he's going to have a... <laughs> then a lot of people who might otherwise be inclined to pull the lever for him uh, come 2020, he runs the risk that what they're going to want instead is just for it to be over. Like, we just need a break. We just need the, the temperature to come down. We just can't take this tempo anymore. That's certainly what the press is trying to set up. They have been making noise since this guy got elected. He is, he's a Nazi, he's a white supremacist, he inspires shooters, he's a Russian asset, he's uh, got dementia. They haven't stopped since he started. And this, is, and this isn't just like, you know, clowns like Donnie Deutsch and Joy Reid. These are actual so-called journalists. I don't think you can refer to journalists as clowns. That's a, <laughs> a complete threat to the safety of the these guys. It's also just, very offensive to clowns, so it, you, you don't want to do that. <laughs> But, but it, is, it, is interesting. it is interesting to think about Trump in silence for a minute. If you think, if you just take out all the noise of the Trump administration, 
it's a pretty good presidency, you know. No more, there's no wars. The economy is ticking along, you know. It, it, and it's nothing, it's, it's, it's nothing magical. It's just pure kind of center-right governance, which always works. A little conservatism here and there. Isn't that kind of like good. saying, with, if you turn the sound off, Green Day is a good band? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it, that, that, look, here's the deal. With every Republican president, they try to make this person out to be evil. With Trump, they've obviously ramped it up in dramatic ways. I mean, even more than they did with Bush Hitler, right? I mean, I'm old enough yeah. to remember Bush Hitler. Yeah. He was not Hitler, as it turns out. That was, that was Trump, as it turns out. But they, <laughs> but they decided that, that Trump was going to be all these things. The thing is, when people are calling you crazy and senile and volatile, the thing you would like to not look like is crazy, senile, and volatile. <laughs> and the big problem for the president right now is, as you say, if it were just about his accomplishments, then he'd be reelected, and I don't think it would be particularly close. Mm. Who else are they going to put up against him? The, the Hillary Clinton 0.5 version of Elizabeth Warren <laughs> or, or narc Kamala Harris? Like, who, who exactly would it be? The, the problem for him is that because he is who he is, he's yeah. obviously alienating a lot of suburban women. It's hurting, it's hurting Republicans, particularly in purple areas. And that's a really, really dangerous thing. Look, I've, I've said to the White House, they know this. I mean, I, everyone at the White House knows this except for President Trump. All they have, they have one or two strategies available to them to guarantee his reelection. Strategy number one, they need to create a fake Twitter app. They need to <laughs> upload it to his phone. <laughs> and he, he tweets. And he tweets into the Twitter app, and he gets back just a bunch of people like, Mega, Mega, you're the best, it's and he's just so happy all day. <laughs> and then he goes out there and he tries to make permanent the tax cuts, right? I mean, and, and, and he thinks that this is all real, but it's not. It's like Truman Show just for him. That's, that's, that's strategy number one. Like it? Yeah. Strategy number two is they go upstairs into the top level of the White House, and they stock it with Shark Week and a porn star, and just leave him there for two years. <laughs> <laughs> and he's president forever. President for life. President for life. <laughs> but but, if, but his, his personality is, I mean, listen, the, the reason that people despise him is not because of his policies, because the fact is that until he was elected, nobody even knew what his policies were really going to be. No, right? it's, it's a personality question. Of course. And he seems not capable of holding that in. I would love but, to see him do it. But so, but, so, we are doing a live show, and this is our first time to have 3,000 people uh, sitting in an audience hall. Right. Did, did, did we bring enough booze for 3,000 people? We need a miracle. We need someone like the president. I don't know. I don't know. We'll figure it out. It becomes to turn later. water into whiskey? Yeah, water. that's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, we are also, however, shooting our normal uh, podcast slash internet uh, television show. And as such, we have some advertising sponsors. Oh. What we would love, we hope you love our ad sponsors as much as we do. They make it possible for us to be able to bring this content to you uh, on a daily basis with the guys' shows, on a monthly basis with this show. So let's hear it for our first sponsor of the night, Policy Genius. <laughs> so these days, a lot of workplaces offer some pretty nice perks. Over at the Daily Wire, we offer you both the possibility of some life insurance and also the opportunity to run around on stage like a moron wearing a giant weird outfit. But if you work in place that doesn't offer you sufficient life insurance, here's what you need, policygenius.com. Why, well, ben, why does a person need life insurance? Because if you're an adult, you might die. <laughs> and, and if you die, you might not care what happens next, but your family probably does and be like, oh, that schmuck who didn't get life insurance. Now I can't even afford to bury him. I gotta cremate him and I gotta dump him on the table here in the ashtray for Crowder. <laughs> Thus, you need Policy Genius. It is the easy way to shop for life insurance online in just minutes. You can compare quotes from top insurers and find the right amount of coverage at the best possible price. If you have a workplace life insurance, Policy Genius can review that policy, let you know what additional coverage you might need. So remember, workplace life insurance policies, they're like workplace snacks, better than nothing, but never quite enough. Head on over to <laughs> policygenius.com today. Find out how to supplement your workplace life insurance, better protect your family. Policy Genius, as they say, it's like a buffet made of life insurance. Delicious. Also, you should buy life insurance, be an adult, right? Okay, don't be, don't be a schmuck, buy life insurance, make sure your family is taken care of, don't be buried in a pauper's grave, and everything will be fine. I mean, you'll be dead, but, but the rest of your family will be fine. <laughs> Policygenius.com. Policy Genius. Hey. hey! Drew, you seem like you uh, don't agree with Ben's analysis uh, regarding the president's Twitter account. Well, no, I mean, look, the, tw 
Trump was elected to do what he does. And the fact that he has the, is boorish enough and crazy enough to do it means he's going to be boorish and crazy. He's always going to step over the line. And I think, but I think it's important. Look, I think the press, the press has created, the press has created a world in which we're always the bad guy. We're, you know, it's a world of complete fantasy. It doesn't even make any sense. On the one hand, Donald Trump, our president, is Adolf Hitler. On the other hand, we shouldn't have any guns. So it doesn't even, it's, not, it's, not even, it's not even a world that's making, making much sense. And they've been doing this, as you say, they, they did it to Bush, they've been doing it, they did it to, certainly to Richard Nixon, who did terrible things, but nothing worse than Lyndon Johnson did, nothing worse They did than, to Mitt Romney, the most milquetoast human I, being they, they, who's it, ever walked here. Exactly, the exactly. Right. So th this, is a, this is a cultural thing. We need a voice, a guy who's not afraid. And anybody who's not afraid has got to be a little bit nuts at, the, in this, at this point. How I wish the United States were and how the voting population of the United States goes, maybe two separate questions. You know, uh, again, I, I don't want to belabor the point, but we're all in favor of Trump being the hammer that hits the nail. As I've been saying for literally years at this point, it's when he hits the baby that everybody begins to get a little bit yeah, worried. Yeah. And lately, particularly, he seems to be hitting a lot of babies. He, he's turned into Leroy Jenkins in the last few weeks, right? <laughs> I mean, like Ilhan Omar and the squad, they're having a fight with Nancy Pelosi, and they're going at it, and everybody's like, this is great, just let them pummel each other. And Trump's like, Leroy Jenkins! <laughs> and he just charges right in the middle. And then all of a sudden, the narrative is not that anymore. Now he's in the middle of the narrative. Or just this last week, Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib, who are disgusting anti-Semites. I mean, just awful, awful people. Yeah. Serious Jew haters. You know, the, these folks decide that they are going to, they decide they're going to go to Palestine, right? Jerusalem, Palestine. And they're right, going that, to... That's that country next to Narnia and uh, on the other <laughs> side of Wakanda. Is that where that is? <laughs> oh, yeah. My geography is a little wonky. I don't know. And they're sponsored by a group called MIFTA, which actually pushes the blood libel. And the media, as you say, are awful, terrible people. And so they ignore that entire story. Right? It is not important at any point that these women were sponsored by an actual blood libel pro-terror group. It's important that Israel said no. Right? That was the, the Jews were the problem because they're not as high on the intersectional pyramid. So now Trump, has, now Trump does have something to hit with. Right? I mean, he can say, look at, look at these awful anti-Semitic congresswomen who are retweeting cartoons from cartoonists who competed in the Iran Holocaust <laughs> denial cartoon contest yes, of 2006. Wait, wait, let's pause for a minute and think about the fact that there is a Holocaust denial cartoon contest. I know, I never get picked. <laughs> it's unbelievable. <laughs> Is it a depressing or an uplifting contest? Yeah. Like, <laughs> on the one hand, depressing because historically inaccurate. On the other hand, the Holocaust never happened. So good news, guys. <laughs> All my relatives are back. Yeah, right. But <laughs> we'll, we'll all turn but, up when they clean. But yeah. the, the, the media don't cover any of this. And Trump finally, I mean, he, the last week has provided so many case studies and media bias. And this is Trump's specialty, right? Mm -hmm. Going after the media, this is Trump's specialty. And instead, Trump decides that he's going to jump into a fray that he doesn't need to jump into and be rather nonspecific. Now, his comments in the last couple of days, 48 hours, about about Jews voting Democrat. Listen, I think that if you're a Jew who cares about Judaism, you should not vote Democrat. I think it is wrong for you to vote Democrat. I've been saying this my entire career. I do not know, if you're a Jew who cares about Judaism, I do not know for the life of me how you can possibly vote for a party that upholds Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar as moral superiors. I mean, it's just, it's disgusting and unthinkable. But that is, you have to make clear that you're talking about Jews who care about Judaism. You know, when Trump says things like, all the Jews need to vote for me because the Jews care about Israel. Now you're running along the line of dual loyalty charges. You're running along the line of just because you were born into a Jewish family, you have to care about Israel. And that is a distinction that he's never going to make because it's a nuanced but distinction, you just obviously. Think of the comparison you're making. You're comparing Trump, who obviously doesn't think before he talks. He's a little, just a tad reckless. And what, what he really said, what he really said was, if you are a Jew, you would be disloyal to Israel to vote for the Democrats, which is kind of literally true. And then he retweeted, he retweeted, he didn't say he was the son of God. He said, he retweeted some clown who was Everyone saying these things. Everyone is saying I'm the son Everyone of God. Saying, it's not just me saying it, it's everybody saying it. So compare that to the fact that these virulent anti-Semites who, who call Israel Palestine, which is the name the Romans gave Israel after they conquered it, after right. they wiped it, it, it's an Anglicization, Anglicization of the word Philistine. Remember the Philistines with Goliath and all that? That's what Palestine right. is, so that's what they go. So it's not really a comparison. It's only a comparison in a world where the press is all on no, one side. No, you're totally right. Yeah. But again, the art of politics is to make it easy for people to vote for you. 
And Trump has to make it easier. He does. I mean, just as a, as a yeah. matter of data, he needs to make it easier for people. Like, listen, everybody who loves him is already going to vote for him. He's not, like, no one is going to say, well, you know, he, he tweeted one last time today, not voting for him anymore. <laughs> right? But there are a lot of people out there who, who feel differently. And Trump has so many victories that are available to him. I mean, that whole New York Times story that unfolded last week, where it came out that Dean Baquet over at the New York Times, the executive editor, had overtly stated to his own staffers that they were shifting from the Trump-Russia narrative to the Trump-Racism narrative. How is that not everything Trump said for an entire week? How is that not every rally? Just him saying, listen, I've been saying for years well, about the fake news, and the they are fake news. I mean, that should have been does, everything, right? The president does a terrible job of running on his successes. And I think part of, part of it is because he's, um, uh, it's a compulsive behavior that he wants to have attention. And the way he's gotten attention for most of his career is actually to do things that are negative. He's kind of like everybody's... Uh, you know, your, your kid brother or whatever. Who, My three-year-old. Who only yeah. knows how to get attention by being bad. The president's been famous for, even for all of Drew's life. That's how long our president has been famous. <laughs> Impossible. No one has been alive he as long as Drew. the Declaration of Independence. He was there at the Constitutional <laughs> right. Convention. You know this man used to have hair? <laughs> I know. Unthinkable. And Donald Trump was president even then. He... <laughs> he's been president... Uh, he, he's been famous for this incredible amount of time usually by being notorious. Now, Donald Trump is, has more notoriety than he has fame. Mm -hmm. As time went on, The Apprentice happens and he gets a, a little more legitimate fame, but he's been a notorious figure. He, he still has those same impulses. What he hasn't learned is that you can actually be beloved, you can actually be supported on the basis of your actual accomplishments. The tax cuts, the great judicial appointments, uh, Gorsuch on the Supreme Court, uh, not having us involved in, in foreign wars, defeating ISIS. He's a, and by the way, yes, fighting the culture wars and yes, properly. Fighting culture wars. Of course, fighting the culture wars properly. But I think that what, he's, what he does instinctively and compulsively, I don't think he control himself, is that even when the news is good for him because it's bad for the left, if it's not specifically about him, <laughs> he wants to make it about him. So he, when he sees horrible press befalling uh, Rashida Tlaib and uh, Ilan Omar and uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, he sees them getting pummeled in the press. Instead of going, this is great, it's going to help me win, he goes, why aren't they talking about me? But, you know, I'd, I'd like something, to give, something, I'd something, like something. To give a counterexample here, which I, I agree. The typical advice would be, when your opponents are killing each other, let them do it and sit back and have a cigar. But in, in the case of the, the real moment when the squad was burning down, Nancy Pelosi was pouncing, she's been waiting for this for two years now, at that moment, Trump inserted himself into the debate and he said, send them back, which was technically not true because they, they weren't immigrants, right? Most of them weren't immigrants. Uh, at that moment, he got a ton of negative press. But what was the conclusion of that? What was the effect of those tweets? The effect was, all of a sudden, you had AOC meeting with Nancy Pelosi. You had all of the so-called moderate Democrats rallying behind these horrific people, Rashida Tlaib, Ilhan Omar, and AOC. That seems like a win. That seems like where we want the Democrats to be, which is showing themselves to be bigoted, hateful radicals. And if they're doing that, I think it puts Trump in a decent light, even if he goes through a couple you know, bad is, weeks is, of news. You know, actually, this is a, it's an interesting conversation because it is a strategy, but it is a very risky strategy because you are turning, you're helping the Democratic Party turn itself into the Labor Party in Britain. Yeah. yeah. And maybe you yeah. think that they're already there. Maybe they are. But stripping off the mask, I'm not sure that that is a good long-term strategy because they do have a 50% chance. They've run the Congress. They do have a 50% chance of winning the presidency. And by the way, I don't think Trump is weak enough that he has to make them all about AOC and Ilhan Omar in order to win. I think Trump can beat Joe Biden if he would shut up for five, like not, not the whole time, just for like every, every five seconds or so would be awesome. Like if he just did that, make all of our jobs easy, that would, I, I think he could win. I, I think there's a real danger in nutpicking the other side. And I think that the Democrats learned that in 2016 when they were like, you know who'd be awesome to run against? That guy Donald Trump. He'll Let's never make it. win. And he'll never win. And Hillary Clinton is like, he should run. And now she's sitting somewhere up in the woods of Chappaqua quietly <laughs> weeping to herself. You know, that's... <laughs> <laughs> what, do you, what do you think of this strategy, though, as a, as a serious strategy? I've thought uh, uh, numerous times... At the time that I met Trump's speechwriters, they said to me, what aren't we doing? What should we do? And I actually have an idea. I actually think that there's a speech Trump should make where he says, I know who I am. I know what I look like. I know what you hear. But look at what I've accomplished. 
where he actually says this, and he just says, yes, you know, I got a big mouth. But Drew, that's, I, called, that's I called would, humility. That's yeah. called humility. I would it's like fake, to, I don't know that. It's humility. It's it's, fake, no, I would, I would like to one day, I would like to one day walk into a quiet little bar in, in uh, rural Texas somewhere and see a guy sitting in the back corner who looks, in, looks a lot like Alex Jones. And to walk up to the back of the bar and, and pull up a chair next to him at the bar and look over and by God, it is Alex Jones. And I'd like, and I'd like for him to look over at me and say, I told them they were making the frogs gay and they made me rich. Can you believe this crap? <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think that's who Alex Jones is. You know, there was I don't a, think he's in on the joke. Trump did have this one moment. It was, the, it was the moment that I thought, gosh, there is some humility there, which is when he was you know, talking about how he's never had a drink. He said, you know, I'm the only president who's never had a drink. Can you believe that? Could you imagine if I did have a drink? Oh, I'd be the worst. It's my only good quality <laughs> that I never had a drink. I thought, oh, this guy really has some self-awareness, no, maybe. The, be does. the best moment of his presidency for me was the time that the Marine's hat blew off. And without right. thinking, he chased it down and put it back on his head. The president of the United States chased down a Marine's no, hat no, and put it back on his head. But that, and that's, that, that's where, again, he does have good instincts. Right? I mean, he does yeah. have some good well, he's instincts. He's really that guy. He really doesn't know, get that he's the president. He doesn't get that he is, <laughs> he is uh, that his words have a kind of moral weight that other people's words don't have. He right. clearly doesn't understand. No, I, I think that's true. I mean, the, the, the good news for him is that the Democrats seem to be just destroying themselves apace. I mean, this I, is, I, yeah. this is. I love the Democrats. I mean, did you see Elizabeth Warren dancing? Oh, sorry? Did you uh, see Elizabeth Warren dancing? Oh, yeah. And then the rain came. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was, it was, she went, you never go full Elaine from Seinfeld. <laughs> and she went full Elaine from Seinfeld. And I thought to myself, this is the great hope, the great white hope. Like, this, this, is, this is Elizabeth Warren. This the, is the great 1,023 <laughs> out of 1,024 white hope, actually, this is, yeah. This is going to be it. I mean, their top three candidates are a dead man, a, <laughs> an alive but not quite their man, and that, that's Bernie, I think. Yeah. It, and Elizabeth Warren, who seems like the, the alpha version of a beta product. <laughs> I, <laughs> I think, I think Elizabeth Warren has a, a real chance of being the nominee. I don't think this is Oh, right. I, I tell you, first of all, Biden, Biden, she has a chance. Biden's, I, I, Biden's I strategy know. now is I, I'm electable. I'm electable. All that has to happen, <laughs> all that has to happen is he loses Iowa and he's done. It's yeah. like oh, his whole argument depends on his not losing. And everybody loses. All front runners lose when they get to Iowa or soon, soon thereafter. So he's, he's not going to make it past a certain number of primaries where people start to question that. And I think Elizabeth Warren's been running a good campaign. She, uh, well, the media, I mean, you want to talk about the media. The just, media backs her up. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. I mean, the media treatment of this yeah, lady, they they are giving her, they're giving her massages in the back room, Robert Kraft style. I mean, it is, <laughs> it, is, it is astonishing. I mean, the treatment that they are giving her is it's the Beto treatment in Texas. I mean, right. and you got, you got, by the way, you got to feel bad for Beto, right? <laughs> like, has I any, love Beto. I love Beto. I mean, just the hands of Beto. Has anybody ever been, oh, I have so many terms I could use here that are inappropriate, <laughs> brought to, to a particular point and then let down, like Beto O'Rourke has been, <laughs> now, by the wait, media? Wait I mean, a it, minute, wait a minute. I, I think that Beto could still get to 2% in the polls. <laughs> I think he's upped his game. He's doing a little better. We can get to a solid two. Bra. This sounds unbelievable, Brad. It's frankly, it's, it's furry phobia. I think it's bigotry, and our country needs to move past it. My question is, what happened to Kamala Harris? I thought she was supposed to be the big uh, superstar she's, that was going to jump up. She looks as nasty as she. Is. We're in California. These people know Kamala Harris. They know how terrible she, she is. Her problem is Half she of them went to prison because of Kamala Harris. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They're out here on leave. <laughs> but no, I mean, uh, Kamala Harris is a perfect example of a politician who didn't even realize she was a politician until it was too late. That's right. Right, because she thought she was going to be this great visionary Obama knockoff. And it turns out that she doesn't even know her own positions on any of the issues. And she figured it was just going to be handed to her. And meanwhile, the white establishment media, it turns out they like white establishment progressive figures who flatter them about their own intelligence. And that's Elizabeth Warren, yeah. Right? Yeah, who, that's of right, course, yeah. doesn't even understand her own programs. Right? She doesn't understand her Medicare for All program. I mean, I know Elizabeth, I, I'm always tempted to call her Professor Warren, because that's how I knew her when she was at Harvard Law School. And she was, she was never this radical. I mean, when she was at Harvard Law School, she, was running as, she, she wasn't running it, but she was always perceived as a sort of 
kind of quasi-populist moderate. She was yep. never this kind of crazed Bernie Sanders type. And now she's bought fully into it. She's obviously the most clever of them. The reason that I say I'm more skeptical of her chances than, than you are, Drew, is because she has no black support. And if, if Biden, if Biden can, all, all Biden has to do is last till South Carolina. If he can last till South Carolina, he will really punch her in the nose. You know, consider, because, consider this, though. Biden is so far ahead in the polls because he fills that, that kind of slot, that outline of an electable guy. If they had an actually electable guy, a guy who was like not 110 years old, a guy who actually had not been corrupt, uh, uh, openly corrupt for, what is it now, 40, 50 years? 50 years. If they actually had a, the guy who was just like a moderate Democrat, I think they'd win. But they haven't I, got that I guy. Think they had, I think for a brief moment they had him in uh, Pete Buttigieg, and then Pete Buttigieg didn't understand that that was actually the best thing he had going for him, was that he was likable right. and seemed moderate and was fairly appealing. And he got out there and everybody's like, ah, fresh face, somebody who we can actually get behind. And he was like, also, I hate Christians. And, <laughs> <laughs> and everybody's like, oh, yeah, no. We're, <laughs> where's Biden? <laughs> yeah. Give us Biden. But the fact is that the reason that it, right now Bernie is running this campaign and the polls have him very variably either up slightly on Warren or down slightly yeah. to Warren. And they're running it about even in the polls, somewhere between 20 and 15 percent for both of them. And that really does leave this continuous lane for Joe Biden to wheel his gurney right up the center. <laughs> I mean, he's running a weekend at Bernie's campaign. It's incredible. Every time, he, every time he's out there, he gaffs. And so his own campaign is like, what if we just stash him over here in this coffin and we'll leave him there until November of 2020? And it may work. It may work because all the other candidates are so unappealing. Uh, again, I think that Elizabeth Warren had that first rough go because of the Native American stuff. And then she's been getting all sorts of wonderful media treatment since. I think there's another point here where the media say, wait a second, she is not intersectional enough. She's a white woman. We need to take another look at this field. We need somebody who, I think, second look at Kamala is coming. I think that in the next oh, few I months. See, but I, the, I, the, question, the question I have with Biden is, people forget that Joe Biden is a complete doofus. They forget because he's been in politics. For, he, I, I don't mean that just to throw a bomb. I mean, he, he is like technically and objectively a complete doofus. He ran in 1988. <laughs> he dropped out of the race because he lied about his law school record and he plagiarized a speech by this Irish politician. Then he did, then, then he passed a good crime bill in 1994 that he now has to run against and pretend he wasn't involved in. Then he ran in 2008. <laughs> He ran in 2008. He was absolutely nothing. The only reason he became vice president is because Barack Obama didn't want to get suicided. I'm kidding. I mean that he didn't want to have Hillary as his vice president. And, and so, never, never put yourself, uh, never put Hillary Clinton one heartbeat away from never, anything that if it's a, your heartbeat. That's <laughs> that is like the move. first rule of politics. And so the, the question I have about Joe Biden is if he can't, he can't really run on anything that he's ever done. The one good thing he did he can't run on. He's running on the Obama legacy, and yet Barack Obama won't endorse him. Why not? What does Obama know that we don't know? Well, I think he knows everything that we do know is the reason right. he won't endorse Joe Biden. Him. Yeah. <laughs> but I will say, did you, see, did you see Biden's campaign ad that he put out in the last 24 hours? We're called Bones. Called Bones, yeah. <laughs> Which, again, bad move when you're 1,000 years old until your lead <laughs> campaign ad is called Bones. It's like a little too on the nose there, Joe. But the, but the ad was basically what you would think it is, and it is the Democrats' best pitch, which is, Everything is too crazy. We need solidity. Joe Biden, Barack Obama, you remember those guys and those nice guys. We, at least it won't be so crazy. And this is why we come back to, you know, if Trump could just tone it down and not be so crazy, it makes it nearly impossible for the Democrats to win. And I'm They're running on sure. his character. They're not running on anything else. And I'm not sure else. that Barack Obama won't at some point end up reluctantly endorsing Joe. If, he th if Barack Obama thinks Joe is the person who can win, and if he sees that as a way of sort of restoring his legacy, then he probably will come off the sidelines at some point. Well, he'll have to eventually, right? Uh, yeah. Stamps.com. Stamps.com. What a great segue. <laughs> I am, is, that guy, is that guy amazing I am or what? famous for my segues, <laughs> and few are better than when I just say the name of the sponsor <laughs> in the middle of the conversation. Well, let me tell you something about Stamps.com, <laughs> since you asked. Tell me. Okay, so I don't like going to the post office. Really? Not because the post office isn't great. Tell me more. The post office is great, but let me explain. <laughs> So the last time I went to the post office, I got a parking ticket. Because let me tell you something about the authorities in Los Angeles. In Los Angeles, they will leave piles of homeless people and their poop and drugs in the street across from my house 
But if I park in the red zone for more than 37 seconds, mm -hmm. there will be a ticket on my yeah. windshield. If Kamala Harris hears about this, you will be in prison for life. <laughs> this is exactly right. You will be in prison for life. So I've made a decision. No longer will I go to my beloved post office. Now, from now on, and this has been true for months, I am using Stamps.com, and we use Stamps.com at the Daily Wire offices because Stamps.com brings all the amazing services of the U.S. Postal Service directly to your computer. Whether you're a small office sending invoices, an online seller shipping out product, even a warehouse sending thousands of packages a day, Stamps.com can handle it all with ease. Drew, do you have anything to say about Stamps.com? I love Stamps.com because it prints, you just put an envelope in a machine and it comes out with a stamp and I say, Granny, Ma, come here and look at the <laughs> printer. It's, it's making stamps in the machine. It's a wonderful thing. And, the printer and, is a new innovation. <laughs> <laughs> and then you know you got to tear you got to tear the little sprockets off. But it's, like, <laughs> it's, a, it's, an it's unthinkably thing. spectacular. <laughs> it's unthinkably. Stamps.com. It's even a no-brainer, which is perfect for Joe Biden. It saves you time and money. <laughs> it's no wonder over seven hundred thousand small businesses already use Stamps.com. Right now, our listeners and those in the audience get a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale, no long-term commitments. That's the best offer you've gotten tonight. Just go to stamps.com, <laughs> click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, Speak type in yourself. Shapiro. <laughs> That's stamps.com, enter promo code Shapiro because I'm the one who does the business around here, <laughs> folks. So. That's Wait, that's all. All right. So it's absolutely, uh, we've talked a little bit about the election, talked a little bit about the candidates. Uh, I think Ben hit on a story a second ago and we moved past it too quickly. I think it's maybe the most important story uh, that's happened in the last three weeks besides that predator, that predator uh, pedophile uh, hanging himself in a jail cell. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I mean, that was a good story. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hanging, hanging himself. himself. Yeah. I'm sorry guys, yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't know you were a conspiracy yeah. theorist. <laughs> you think that Jeffrey Epstein <laughs> hanged himself. All right, that's fine. Yeah, Alex I'm Jones, sorry. all right. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I think the best thing that's been said about this was said by our by our friend Norm Macdonald, who said that uh, you know for for uh, uh, there's a second side to every coin, and that you may think of Jeffrey Epstein as that horrible predator who molested all of those underage uh, women, but he likes to think of him as the guy who killed Jeffrey Epstein. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Going right to heaven. I mean, the real accomplishment for Jeffrey Epstein wasn't that he killed himself. A lot of people are able to accomplish that. It was that he cremated himself too. <laughs> Actually, though, the story that we moved right past is a story of, and I think it's, it's one story, even though it's manifested itself even just in the last 10 days in three or four different ways, and that's the New York Times really revealing yeah. their bias in a way that we've never this is, seen them. This is the most important story that's happened recently. You know, I, I always had this joke, the New York Times, a former newspaper, which I've been making since you and I have met, it's the most prophetic joke I've ever made because the New York Times is now openly a former newspaper and yep. it's important because the new york times sends its budget its list of stories out to newspapers and radio stations and tv stations across the country well this is what people don't understand yeah, it is absolutely the truth that the new york times determines the news for that's the entire right. country and these guys they, they you know, have yeah. they have investigative journalists which almost no publication can afford to have mm -hmm. they're not the only one but they're certainly the dominant uh name brand in this country and they syndicate the news out to all the local News affiliates. And, and people just think this is the New York Times, these must be the important stories. Right. And here is Dean Baguette, nobody knows how to pronounce his last name, Dean Baquet or Baquette, the editor of the New York Times, saying to people, well, you know, we covered this phony Russian story as well as we could, but it blew up in our faces. Now we're going to call Trump racist, racist, racist until 2020 and hope, and hope we win the election. He and essentially that's, said those exact words. That's yep. almost what he said. You know, it's yeah. almost what he said. I mean, they, they actually said in their big story, their uh, 1619 story, they said our purpose for this story is to reframe American history. As, as being centered around slavery and the arguments that they are making, this is the same paper, by the way, that had a series of articles called Red Century, in which they argued that women had better sex in the Soviet Union, which, which is, which is all they had. Which is all they had. <laughs> well, they didn't well, have bread. They, 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 were living, they were living in a room with their like, mother-in-law, you know, like they were living with 15 people in a room, but they were having great, they were just banging. And, <laughs> <laughs> That's why Bernie Sanders was always there with his shirt off. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so now, now they're making the argument, now they're making the argument that the entire founding of, the, of America 
was based on slavery, which is actually the opposite of the literal truth, the opposite of the facts, is that the founders knew slavery was a problem. They wished they could get rid of slavery. They couldn't figure out a way to do it. They got stuck with it, and because they got stuck with it, 700,000 Americans died in the Civil War. That's, that's the truth, and they're just lying yeah. about it in order to make the case that this country is founded on racism when it's actually founded on the opposite of racism and created racism as a problem by being such a great country. You know. there, there are a couple issues here that really are worth breaking down. And one of the issues is that the way that that conversation went, if you actually read the leaked transcript to Slate, it was obvious that the executive editor was basically being bullied by the coffee-fetching intern. That's right. I mean, that's, it's, it's pretty incredible. I mean, the staffers are talking to the executive editor of the New York Times and, and saying, basically, you're not woke enough. Because they, they changed that headline. That's the, right, that's because it said, right, because it said, Trump urges unity versus racism. And this was very bad, because Trump actually had urged unity against racism, <laughs> yeah. and that cuts against their narrative, which is that Trump is the white know. supremacist, right? We're the news. We can't let anybody know about it. <laughs> the news. <laughs> right, but the, but the fact that the, and this is happening at a, a bevy of publications, that the editors no longer run their publications. Mm -hmm. They are run by all of the brand new Wesleyan lesbian dance theory graduates who are interning in the coffee room and who have decided that because they studied intersectional theory in their gender studies course, they get to determine the course of the news. And everybody of the baby boomer generation is deathly afraid of these people and running frightened from these people and saying, you're, you're so right, scourge me, whip me. You know, we have, you're totally, we have to completely change the news coverage here and restructure our newsroom so that racism is at the center of every single story. I mean, this was a question from a staffer. Why isn't racism seen as the foundation of the country and at the root of every story? And Bacay's response was, well, what do you think the 1619 Project is? And these essays are bizarre and insane. <laughs> So there, there was one essay that, that, opened the, uh, that opened the collection that I thought was, it's, it's overbroad, but at least wasn't terribly wrong, right? It said that black people were the people who helped bring about the, full, the fulfillment of freedom in the United States. And I thought to myself, okay, that's true, and they're white allies, right? That was, that was the group of people who did this, right? Black people and all of their allies who fought for civil rights, who fought to overcome slavery, fought to overcome Jim Crow, totally true. Yep. Without black people, obviously, the story of America is not only incomplete, it's wrong. Right? I mean, that, that, that obviously is true. And then come the bad essays, right? And these essays, they said, oh, this is deeply researched. My ass, this is deeply researched. <laughs> okay, so the, these, these we essays. We asked all of our friends. I mean, it, it really was. They went and they got a bunch of their sociology buddies from the, from the faculty lounge to write these garbage essays. And one of these essays by Matthew Desmond suggested that American-style capitalism was rooted in slavery, that it was founded on slavery. This is the most insane contention in the history of economics. Well, their argument, their argument was that the slaveholders had business practices, and businessmen now have business practices. Right. And therefore, there's a relationship. This is it. It's, it's like, it's like, the, it's this like exactly there's, right. stone, there's stone in the pyramid, and there's stone in the Empire State Building, therefore it's based on Hebrew slavery. Right, this is, no, this is exactly right. They were saying things like, you know, every time you fill out an Excel spreadsheet, yes. it's a time sheet. <laughs> it literally says this in the piece, <laughs> that Excel spreadsheet is a vestige of slavery. Now listen, I may not like Excel very much, but I am fairly certain that that has nothing to do with the enslavement, chaining, whipping, raping, and separation of families of black people in 1855. Pretty sure. And this whole thing, and by the way, it is also historically wildly inaccurate to link American-style capitalism with slavery. As de Tocqueville was writing in the 1820s and 1830s, the most economically backward part of the United States by far was the American South, specifically right. because of the slave system, That's which right. is why the North which, ran roughshod over the South during the Civil War. That's right. The South rejected capitalism because you can't embrace the idea of market, free markets and of forced labor. They and that, that was only one of the essays. Then there was the essay that suggested that the reason America doesn't embrace Medicare for all is because of racism, Jim Crow, and slavery. And it's like, no, pretty sure it's the limited government stuff, guys. <laughs> pretty sure it's that. It, it was essay after essay like this, and all of this is directed at a specific point. And that is what the left likes to do, is they like to say something that is false, that is based on maybe a grain of truth, and then they blow it up to the point that it's false, and yep. then you say, that's false, and they say, ah, you're denying the grain of truth. Right? They do this with so many different stories, right. yeah. and they do it right here. So they say, okay, everything in America is based on slavery. And you say, no, that's not true. Slavery is a deep, horrible part of the American story. Certainly, there are after effects of that that obviously shape history, and that's true for every aspect of history, but slavery was so deeply rooted that there are obviously after effects, and for example, wealth discrepancies, thanks to red line. Like, there's some truth to those things. And, but I'm not gonna say that slavery is the root of all American institutions, because it's not true. And they say, well, obviously, this is because you don't take slavery seriously. It's because you don't take racism seriously. And they do this with everything. It's why they specifically pick cases like Michael Brown. It's why Elizabeth yep. Warren and Kamala Harris 
this month, we're pushing a conspiracy theory. You know, they, they yeah. were all over Trump for pushing the Jeffrey Epstein conspiracy theory right. kind of stuff. That same weekend, both Elizabeth Warren and Kamala Harris suggested that Michael Brown, an 18-year-old black man who attacked a police officer, tried to take his gun off of him, fired it inside the car, tried to run away, then turned around and charged the police officer according to witness testimony and Obama DOJ holdings. And multiple autopsies. And multiple autopsies and witness testimony from everybody living in the area that that guy was murdered in cold blood by a white police officer for racist reasons. That was tweeted out by two separate Democratic presidential candidates. The reason they do that is so that if you note that their story is false, they can claim that you are being too light on racism. See, this is their goal. They're, it's it's all is, a setup. This is the election we're looking at. On the one hand, you have the base of the Democrat Party that actually believes that, whether it's true or not. They think it's true, whether it's true or not. The narrative is more important than the truth. Then you have the Trump base, which is basically they don't care what he tweets, they don't care what he says, they love the guy, they're fine. But between those people, there has got to be, there has got to be a large group of Americans who think like, yeah, Trump's a loudmouth, but I am so sick and tired of people telling me I'm a racist. <laughs> I mean, so I'll tell you. I hope that that's right. I'm not sure that it is. I'm not sure that the group in the middle who isn't in either camp, you think that they're going to say, Trump's a loud mouth, but I like the stuff that we're getting and I don't like what the left is saying. I worry that that, I worry that, that group of people, I worry that that group of people is actually going to say, Trump's a loud mouth, and I just want everybody to be nice to each other again, like they were back in the Obama days. <laughs> no, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a legitimate fear. It is a it's, legitimate it's, it's fear. It's a serious worry. Yeah, I mean, there was poll data that was out this week that suggested that for the Americans who don't like either Joe Biden or Donald Trump, they were breaking 45-10 in favor of Biden. That is very different from the poll data in 2016, which showed that of the, can of the voters who didn't like either Hillary or Trump, they were breaking in favor of Trump. Now, with all of that said, listen, we all feel this, right? I mean, the left is on a rampage, and, the, and it's evil. I mean, it really is. They have taken the online world of dunking and being dunked upon, and they've extended it to the real world. That's right. And it's making people, it, it is making people crazy, and it's justifiably making people who are even mildly conservative want to throw up the middle finger that is Trump. Right. I mean, listen, I, right. I feel it too. I mean, over the weekend, I was in Sacramento, and I was out there with my kids. This happened two times in three weeks. I was out there with my kids, just at a, at a park, and some, some middle-aged white couple comes up behind me, and I hear them hiss, ah, there's that anti-immigrant fanatic. They're always protesting him. That was me. That was and, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm carrying my five-year-old in my arms at the time. And I turned around, I said, I'm libertarian, and I start to walk away. And this person, who obviously has no familiarity with any of my immigration positions, immediately turns around and says, well, there's enough hate to go around. How do you sleep at night? And I thought to myself, this kind of thing makes me want to walk over broken glass to vote for Trump just to say, you, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, like that's... Right. And I think there are a lot of Americans who feel that way, too. So I, I, I hear you, Trump. Go for it. Go been, for that segue. That, I've that, been working on I this I see one. it. I can smell it coming. That's I've been it. working on this one. <laughs> Jasper loves you too. Jasper doesn't care about you. I think. <laughs> when you die, He's Jasper will eat your corpse. That's, that's I know reality. Jasper. Like... When, uh, with the news media rewriting our history, it's important to reflect on the true founding of America. And remember that when the founders crafted the Constitution, the first thing that they did was make sacred our rights in a Bill of Rights, including the Second Amendment. And... <laughs> Without which there would be no limitation on government. And that's why I'm so proud of our sponsor, Bravo Company Manufacturing. Unbelievable, he not. stuck the landing. <laughs> they do not call him the God King for nothing. <laughs> do you love guns? <laughs> I also, coincidentally, here, love guns. Guns are great. They're great for protecting yourself against the government that wants to quash your rights. They're great for protecting yourself against people who want to kill you. I know, there are a lot of people who want to kill me. <laughs> Owning a rifle is an awesome responsibility. Building rifles is no different. Started in a garage by a Marine veteran more than two decades ago. Bravo Company Manufacturing, BCM for short, builds a professional grade product which is built to combat standards. Bravo Company Manufacturing is not a sporting arms company. They design, engineer, and manufacturing life-saving equipment, which is the kind I care about. I'm not a hunter, I know a lot of people are, but I'm mostly about, I need a gun because if someone comes in my house, I want to shoot them in the face. The people of BCM. Yeah. <laughs> I should, 
I should amend that. If you're invited into my house, I don't want to shoot you in, in the face. <laughs> but if you come in my house without permission in the middle of the night, I'm not going to stop to ask questions. You're going to get shot in the face. Are we still, we're still doing dinner this weekend? <laughs> we're still on for dinner at your place? You do not have permission to enter my house. <laughs> Yikes. Come to my house, Knowles. Come to my house. The people at BCM assume that when a rifle leaves their shop, it will be used in a life or death situation by a responsible citizen, law enforcement officer, or a soldier overseas. If you want to learn more about Bravo Company Manufacturing, we actually all do know the people who run the company, they're fantastic. Head awesome. on over to bravocompanymfg.com. You can discover more about their products, special offers, upcoming news. That's bravocompanymfg.com. If you need more convincing, find out even more about BCM and the awesome people who make their products at youtube.com yeah. slash bravocompanyusa. This is actually true about Bravo Company. If you've never gone to YouTube, and watched their amazing videos about their company. It's like you'll go down the, uh, you'll get sucked into the black hole of Bravo Company manufacturing just from how great their videos are. And it's a common thing with a lot of our, um, with a lot of our clients, which actually, or a lot of our ad sponsors, which actually makes us nervous is that they can make good content too. Like our pals from Black Rifle Coffee are here today and they make great content. They do. And, like and, they're, and we'd like you to stop but just because you. <laughs> Could yeah, you stop making your videos content? are yeah. funnier than ours? Yeah, Black Rifle Coffee, please leave leave it to also, the professionals. I had on, it was it was really disheartening. I, I've I've been working to become famous for a long time, <laughs> and I assumed that with that would come great love and adoration. And then <laughs> I had on Matt Best from Black Rifle, and Matt Best is like a cartoon superhero. I, know. <laughs> I mean, he looks like a cartoon superhero. His and last it, name is Best. Yeah. And the and the <laughs> entire comment section was young women drooling over Matt Best. And I thought to myself, well, you know, you can't win them all. <laughs> <laughs> so before we left, I teased a story, because in addition to being, when you're a professional host yeah. like I am, you both segue into ads, and you also tease what's going to come up after the intermission. Uh, what happened to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez? The chick disappeared. You know, you, I know what happened. I know what happened. Any good idea I've ever had, any accurate observation I've ever gotten was from my wife, sweet little Elisa. <laughs> and this morning, it, it was, I, I roll over in my bed on my purple mattress. We're still doing product pitches, right? <laughs> I, I roll over in my bed and I, and I see sweet little Elisa. He goes, hey, Mac. I said, yeah. He goes, whatever happened to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez? I said, I don't know whatever happened to her. She goes, I think that chief of staff, Saikat Chagravati, was really just the whole brains behind the operation. And now that he's gone, she's nothing thought, oh my gosh, that is the most accurate political analysis <laughs> of that situation. Can, now can now you, that her chief of staff is gone, she's gone. Can you believe that this man does that impersonation of his wife and he's still married? <laughs> <laughs> she, you know, she does talk to me, but she has not listened to me in many, many years. So it's, <laughs> she doesn't hear this guy's <laughs> Yeah, I do think it's funny that she's completely vanished. I think you're right as far as the chief of staff. It's almost as though an organization called Justice Democrats <laughs> had a casting session to pick someone to run for public office. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cast a lovely young lady to be a congresswoman, backed her, got her elected, made her very, very famous. Mm -hmm. Then she fired them and... Uh, and she's done. It's almost <laughs> exactly like that with documentary proof. Yeah, that's so interesting. Wow. <laughs> How about this, that? It actually erases a certain conspiracy theory, though. Uh, people have always told me, you know, Dick Cheney is the power behind George Bush, and the Illuminati are behind uh, Donald Trump, and George Soros owns Barack Obama, and all this kind of stuff. And the, the, what I, my response has always been, it may very well be true that powerful entities exist in, uh, and, and they wield money and they wield influence and then they elevate certain people to elected office. But once they get you into public office, you have all the power. And I think this is actually proof. They picked Cortez, they, they elevated her, they got her into office. They were, the, they were pulling all the levers like she was the Wizard of Oz. Only now she's the congresswoman and all she has to say is, yeah, yeah, yeah you're fired. I, right. I, have, I have another theory that I've been developing literally over the course of the last 15 seconds. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that is, I mean, it really goes, it cuts against my religious beliefs and basically my whole view of the universe. What if God is actually incredibly stupid, but he raptured all the stupid people? <laughs> so she's just gone. <laughs> <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.
Well, you guys could listen to us gab on and on about nonsense all day long, but we actually want to hear from you some of your questions. And we were just kidding. Here's Alicia Krause. <laughs> Alicia. Yeah. How's your baby? Precious and sleeping backstage at Backstage. <laughs> That's why we named it such. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to be here. Lots of fun. Have great questions from the audience tonight, which is really cool because usually only subscribers get to ask the questions. So we're ready to roll? Let's do it. All righty. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you. That for the record, was a man's voice, and I don't think it was your dad, and it's not my mom, so yay. <laughs> all right. Oh, thanks. Ben, <laughs> what are your thoughts on all of your fans being called your shapeeps? <laughs> well, it's flattering, um, but I really think they should be called the Ben Liebers. No, I, branding? No, nah, no. Nah. You know what? Screw it. Forget it. Shapeeps it is. Shapeeps. <laughs> All right, serious question, it sounds like. How would you address the argument that simply taxing Wall Street speculation could fund Bernie Sanders' free plans for everything? Of course it can't. And as a financial advisor, I know how I would approach the discussion. That said, I'm curious, how would you address the argument if conversing with a Bernie bro? Well, there are a couple ways to address this. Number one is the pure unworkability of believing that taxes are going to pay for a $32 trillion plan over the next 10 years, which is, amounts to a full doubling of the yearly federal budget. Bernie Sanders has no plans to actually fill that gap because nobody has any plans to fill that gap. That is simply too much to fill. I mean, the fact is we are running a $1 trillion deficit every year under a Republican Senate and a Republican president. So that ain't going to cut it. And uh, a tax on Wall Street transactions, unless you mean literally confiscating all wealth involved in any Wall Street transaction, is not going to pay for it. And even if you did that, you can only do that for like maybe a year. And that would pay for everything for maybe a year. So. That's argument number one. Argument number two is the fact that taxing Wall Street transactions does, in fact, impact all the people who invest in the market. And at this point, that is nearly everyone in the United States economy, pension funds, teachers funds. I mean, you're talking about a huge number of union funds that are, that are in the market. So right. when you talk about tra taxing Wall Street transactions, you're not talking about hitting Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs is still going to make its money. They don't care. I mean, they're just going to upcharge everybody, right? They're just going to raise the price of the actual transaction cost and then pass it on to the consumer. The people who are going to get hurt are the people who are paying Goldman Sachs to actually make those trades on the market. It's, it is odd that the left, whenever they want to get rid of something like cigarettes, they tax it, realizing that people do something less when you tax it. So when they tax Wall Street transactions, you get fewer Wall Street transactions, well, I, I think especially that, it, from the people who are paying the ultimate price. It, it's very easy for people to rip on Wall Street, uh, Wall Street quote unquote speculators, because people don't actually know what Wall Street does. And you, you feel like they're just pushing dollars around and they're not producing a product. So what is it that they actually do? And the answer is that liquidity in financial markets is what provides the, the incentive to create new businesses, right. to IPO them, to allow people to invest their money in businesses that they don't actually own. All of that seems pretty important when it comes time to retire and in the development of the American economy as a whole. All righty. That's the first time that liquidity in markets has ever gotten a round of applause ever, but I appreciate it. We have a very financially literate crowd. Oh, this is very, very important for the God King himself. How has your life changed since getting your blue check mark? Ah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How much time do we have? Yeah. Well, for anyone I'm going to sit back who... with popcorn and just enjoy. Hey, you can eat it off the floor if it falls. <laughs> For anyone who uh, hasn't helped me reach my personal goal of having even more Twitter followers than Alicia, you could go over to at Jeremy D. Boring and just give me a like right now. I'd appreciate it. Uh, it actually did all start, uh, and Alicia, you and I have never discussed this, but uh, a year ago, I noticed that Alicia had 26,800 Twitter followers, and I had 212. And I thought, I can't live in this world. I can't live in this world. And so I set about to see if I could beat her uh, and so I began tweeting incessantly. And uh, a day came when I finally had gotten to 28,000 uh, 
Twitter followers, and I noticed at that time that Elisha had 36 because she was also <laughs> growing. And that's when I realized that my entire problem was that I did not have a blue check mark. The only problem. <laughs> Interestingly, by the way, during this time when he was spending all this time incessantly tweeting, I think revenue went up at Daily Wire. <laughs> <laughs> Not enough. He actually does have a Twitter account, Jasper the Chief, at Jasper the Chief. Uh, and if my dog gets more Twitter followers than me, then I'm basically going to shut down the company. <laughs> <laughs> all righty. So Ben, why do you suppose that Media Matters left you off of the six minute and 53 second Daily Wire highlight reel that they posted on Twitter? Well, <laughs> not to revel in my own fame and abilities, but the fact is that Media Matters has dedicated half of their entire staff to just watching my show. So this is actually a mutually beneficial phenomenon. I mean, they're like the leech, they're the barnacle on the ass of a whale. And They provide, uh, we provide them with material so they can fundraise from their sucker donors and so that they can create clips out of context so that all of their blue check marked friends from Al Jazeera can retweet stuff around the internet and so that the Hill can make a little bit of money off of clickbait. And then they repay us in the form of leftist tears mm -hmm. in our Tumblr <laughs> because they cry and they whine and they can't do anything about us because all of you subscribe, which we really appreciate. And they actually must own a Leftist Tears Tumblr, considering they are certainly annual subscribers and watch the show every single day. I love, I love the nature of their criticism. They released this video uh, of, of Michael and Drew and Matt Walsh and all these horrible things that they said. And I thought, oh, well, I watched it and I thought, oh man, what did our guys say? Is there going to be some really terrible stuff? The headline basically could have been, Daily Wire contributors believe in conservatism. <laughs> Like, I suspect their next headline will be, Ben Shapiro talks very fast. <laughs> you know, the, the folks at Media Matters are basically militantly stupid children who refuse to understand the most basic English statements. So you'll say something that is perfectly obvious, like however many jobs you choose to get in the United States, that's a you problem, meaning it's a problem you have to solve because that's a thing for you to solve, not a thing for government to solve. And it's perfectly obvious. And they're like, a you problem? Are you saying that's a problem with me? Are you saying I'm inferior? <laughs> And it's like, no, that's not what I'm saying. I speak English. And they're like, because you're a racist. <laughs> no. The language of racists. Right. And, uh, and that's, that's how our relationship goes. So it's, it's a little bit dysfunctional, but I think we both get something out of it. <laughs> you know, you bring up a point. I think we should hit it one more time. Uh, it is absolutely true that we're, that we're greedy capitalists and we want a lot of subscribers so that we can buy nice watches and fast cars. We also... <laughs> need subscribers because there is a concerted effort from organizations like Media Matters uh, and the left more broadly to take away our advertising revenue. Ben appeared at the March for Life uh, earlier this year. And for the crime of believing that babies have a fundamental right to be born, uh, Media Matters... <laughs> Media Matters made a concerted effort to take all of our advertisers away from us. And fortunately, uh, you'll never hear us stop lauding our wonderful advertisers, and, and we have great partners, uh, and most of them stuck by our side. Mm -hmm. Not all of them stuck by our side, uh, and enough money that it put the livelihoods of ourselves and of our employees at Jeopardy walked out the door. It's a very real threat. You can imagine that as the election draws nearer, uh, their attacks are not, going to, uh, are not going to diminish. You know, on this point of the March for Life and those blood-sucking hyenas at Media Matters, I will point out, in that uh, best of clip, is what I call it, uh, that they put together <laughs> of me and Drew and Matt Walsh, the most egregious statement that they found that I said was over the Ralph Northam, the governor of Virginia, uh, that whole episode when he wore blackface and then the same week that that came out, he said that we should be able to kill babies after they've been born. And I made the egregiously bigoted statement. I said, I think, I'm just, this is my opinion, I think it's a little bit worse to kill babies after they have been born than to wear an offensive costume 30 years ago. And they... <laughs> 
I think. I don't know. But I would think. But, but here's the good news in all of this, really. I mean, what Jeremy's saying is correct. The fact is that when all of that happened at the beginning of the year, sure, that hurt us a little bit, but we could tell everybody to go screw because the fact is that we had subscribers like you who were out there making sure we could bring you the content that you want. That's and this right. is true for, by the way, this isn't just true for us. Okay, this is true for the folks over at, over at the Blaze Media. This is true for Fox News. If you like stuff, you should go subscribe to it because you are the protection against the nasty cusses on the left who want to censor everything. And besides that, there is no better ashtray in America today <laughs> than the Louder with Crowder Mug Club Mug. And, and, and this, is, this is the whole game, the whole game. You know, we can disagree on policy, we can have arguments about how best conservatism can be served, but if we can't speak, if we can't make jokes, if we, can't, if we have to think about everything we say because they're going to cause this outrage panic in our sponsors are going to disappear, we're done. We're finished, all of us. And I think that the fact that our sponsors stick with us are great, but basically it's you guys subscribing that keeps us alive. And yeah, that's, that's right. That's it. So this is really cool. Thank you. David brought his entire family from Toronto to see you guys tonight. Wow. Right. Feel free to get any necessary MRIs, CAT scans, sonograms while you're here. Dental well, work. Also, good news for you, you won't have to live outside America much longer once President Trump makes Canada our 51st state. <laughs> Washington's greatest mistake. <laughs> so David wants to know, since you flew all that way, a question yes. for all y'all, who was the best American president in U.S. history? Michael? George Washington actually was. I know it's the obvious answer, but he's, he's just peerless, even among the founding fathers, even among all of the other presidents. So Washington takes the cake. Obviously, yeah, George Washington, I guess. he you know, Definitely Washington. And then honorable mentions, Adams, Lincoln, Reagan, and of course, of course, <laughs> President Kofefe himself, Donald J. Trump. Throw popcorn at him. <laughs> All right, keeping in line with the presidential discussion tonight, if the election were tomorrow, what would each of you do? Would you pull the le lever for Trump against the Democratic field? Show of hands, who'd vote for Trump? <laughs> so, so you picked up two votes right here. <laughs> <laughs> It is true. Neither Ben nor I voted for the president in the last election, and uh, things have. People will say, "What's changed since then?" Well, a lot's changed. Things that were unknown are now known. Yep. Things that were feared either didn't happen or did, and now are baked into the fabric. And I think Ben has spoken about this uh, fairly eloquently in the past. the The bottom line is that the 2016 election was what it was. The 2020 election seems to me that it's going to be a race between. Uh, a, a fairly bombastic figure who is not always easy to support, and a completely radicalized, insane socialist left that must not get the levers of power in this country. I have a feeling you might want to offer this uh, fan a job because they want to know, in, why did you name Backstage Backstage instead of, quote, The Boring Show, the most <laughs> ironically thrilling podcast in America? <laughs> <laughs> I love you too. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we, you know, it's funny, we actually did toy with calling it like Cigars with the God King, we toyed with calling it uh, Drinks in Jeremy's Office, and then we realized that I'm not very famous. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we went with Backstage. <laughs> all right, serious, serious question that we all want to know the very important answer to. What do we have to do to get Michael Knowles fired? <laughs> so, <laughs> let's discuss this in a serious fashion. If someone just yelled, Knowles' lives matter, Knowles' lives matter. <laughs> I would hate it if people started to everyone, chant that. I would hate that. Everyone that who thinks that Knowles should be fired, say I. Oh. 
Aye. All opposed? So, the you, eyes, the eyes have it. <laughs> You're like that guy at the DNC convention. I don't, I don't let, believe let me, that. Let me explain. So, Jeremy Boring and I have been business partners for what, nearly ten years at Almost this point. Almost a decade. Yeah. Almost a decade. Jeremy Boring and I have been business partners. There are very few matters on which we have thoroughly disagreed. <laughs> One of them is the continued employment of Michael Moulton. <laughs> In any good marriage, there are certain times where you just have to say, you know what, we disagree. You can have your way, and. As much as it pains me on a personal level each and every day to wake up knowing that this human being is in my life, <laughs> I sometimes have to let my business partner have his way. And so if you're going to blame anybody, blame the schmuck. <laughs> <laughs> and Ben has very, very cold feet at night. <laughs> Oh, thanks. Alicia for Congress is a great idea. That is a great idea. I think I'd have to move back to Oklahoma to win that one. Correct. Yeah. The, real, the real problem that Alicia would have in Congress, though, is that she believes some things. Mm -hmm. But hey, I don't, you know, I don't know it'd be a fresh change. Me <laughs> and Dan that. Crenshaw could go to bat together. That could be fun. We could, we could mend some Red River rivalry, you know? work together, Oklahoma and Texan side by side. If you make another Oklahoma reference, I'm going to vomit. <laughs> Continue. Boomer. All righty. <laughs> Do you think we are headed for a recession and what's causing the commotion? Is it hashtag fake news? Drew? Well, you know, actually, I think a lot of this has to do with the fact that it's August, and in August, some of the smarter investors go to the beach, and it actually thins out the, the beach. It's true. It's true. It, it, thins out, it thins out the number of people, smart people, making decisions in the market, and the markets get very volatile. Happens every August. We're due for a recession, and what I'm a little bit afraid of is that I think back to the, uh, election, the can, election between uh, George H.W. Bush and Clinton, yeah. when the great Reagan economy, which lasted through the Clinton years and through most of the George W. Bush years, when it took a little bit of a dip. And that's, remember, the campaign where Clinton ran on the economy stupid. And the reason he was able to do that was the press made such a big deal out of this little dip in the economy, this incredible recession that had come upon us. And you can just tell they are slavering, waiting for a little dip. I actually think that's dip. the bigger story. Can you believe how the left openly roots for the economy <laughs> of the country to amazing. collapse it's so that they can win a freaking election? Now, they, I mean, Bill Maher at least had the courage to come out and say it. He is rooting for a recession to get rid well, of Trump. Because why? Because he's not going to lose his job. I mean, two, I mean, look, two things can be true at once. One, the media is obviously slavering, hoping for a recession. They would like to see the economy take a dump before the election so they can blame it on Trump. There's a poll out today showing that if there is some sort of recession, 69% of Americans would blame that largely on President Trump. Obviously, the media see that. At the same time, there are some fundamental problems with the global economy. Not so much the American economy, but the global economy. Chinese manufacturing has slowed dramatically. The tariffs are hurting China. You cannot hurt China without also hurting the United States. They do $700 billion worth of business with us every year. It is also true that Germany has a significant slowing in their economy. They're now providing bonds with negative yields. Right, the, the first inversion, time in 30 years. Yeah, I mean, the inversion of the yield curve is a pretty good signal that a lot of investors who are not interested in losing their money for the sake of politics are yeah. rushing to the bond market because they are uneasy about the numbers. I mean, there's a report that came out tonight that downgraded job growth last year by half a million jobs. The, the, the biggest problem right now for President Trump is that he doesn't have a lot of tools at his disposal that he is willing to use. He's, he's ranting and railing against the Fed, and that really doesn't help too much, because on the one hand, he's promoting the message that the economy is really solid and on good footing and everything's going to be fine. And on the other hand, he's tweeting out like a maniac that the Fed needs to cut the, the yield by 100, that it needs to cut the rates by 100 basis points, right, which is a crisis kind of treatment. What President Trump should theoretically be doing is pushing very hard for making permanent the tax cuts that, yeah. were, that were temporary. Yeah, sure. I mean, those, those tax cuts were temporary, they're going to sunset, he should be pushing to make those permanent. The reason that the economy has been so good under Trump is not really even just because of the tax cuts and because of the regulatory changes, it's because business in America got confident the moment he was elected that he was not going to crack down on them and hurt them. I, you know, I hate to be optimistic because it's so lonely, but, uh, <laughs> but 
but in fact, people don't vote a recession. They vote the recession they feel. They vote when they start to feel bad. And right now, consumer confidence is at record highs. Uh, if there were anything but a crash, we wouldn't really feel a recession for two years, for about 26 months. Well, this and is so, a, I mean, and, the, the yield so, curve inversion is a 22-month so, yeah, window. So, so yeah. The election is actually not going. To, I know that the press hopes this will happen, but I don't think there's going to be the kind of recession that's going to affect the election uh, coming up in 2020. Look, we know, we know the press is going to do every single yeah. thing it can to make this look bad for Donald Trump. And that's why I think it's a positive thing that Trump has hammered them the way he has hammered them and taken them on the way he's taken them on. It has been a long time. It has been a long time since any president, it's been since Reagan, it's been since Reagan, since any president has turned to the press and said, Said, you lie and they lie they just lie and I think at this point the people get it and I so I don't think I don't think there's going to be a recession that's going to hurt the president that's what I that's I also I want to say though that if you ever find yourself no matter who you vote for no matter what party you support if you ever find yourself in a position where you're saying to yourself I hope older people lose their retirement savings so that the person I like can win yeah. a presidential election you have lost your freaking soul yeah yeah And, and let's not let's not forget these are the same people who under George W. Bush hoped we'd lose the war so that he would lose the election. The That's same right. people. Yeah. All right, along those lines, what do you gentlemen think is the greatest threat to America today? Michael. The greatest I mean there, there are so many <laughs> That was his that answer. Was answer. <laughs> that was his answer actually, yeah. <laughs> It, it depends if you're talking about the short term, the medium term, or the long term. You know, even when we're talking about the economy, the trouble with economic pessimism is eventually you're right. You know, in the, in the long run, we're all dead, and in the long run, there will be a recession, there will be an economic downturn. So right now, we're in the midst of a trade war with China that has really been going on for about 18 years now, and we're finally fighting back. And there's even some bipartisan agreement on this. Chuck Schumer is one of the few Democrats who talks openly about getting tough on China. Uh, President Trump just today said he is the chosen one who is going to be the first guy to get tough on China, which, which does pose a serious economic and geopolitical threat. They steal our IP, they violate trade treaties, they illegally subsidize steel and aluminum, they spy on us, they challenge our interests in, uh, in the region. So that's a real worry. The bigger problem is on, not on the political level, it's on the cultural and religious level. The, uh, as uh, St. Andrew Breitbart, who everyone knew, actually I got here unfortunately after he was gone, he pointed out that politics is downstream of culture, and culture we know is downstream of religion. What the culture worships uh, defines that culture. Cult and culture are related terms. It's time for Catholic talk. It's, yeah, Lord. and now, <laughs> now let me all bring you into the church. And what, what this means, though, is as we see Pew Research always shows these studies, people are getting less and less religious. The biggest, bigger group now is the nuns, the religiously unaffiliated. We don't have a sense of who we are, what we're doing. We don't have a sense of virtue. We don't have much of a sense of justice anymore. In the long run, that's going to really kill us. John Adams said that the Constitution is built for a moral and religious people. That wasn't him speaking out of some sort of Christian bias. He meant it very seriously, and it's a, a really true statement. Actually, the, the most uh, sound and insightful thing that any Democrat said on that debate stage the other night was that Marianne Williamson, of all people, said, that there is a dark psychic force and that's what we have to attack. Now she thinks it's Trump, I think it's the devil, she thinks that Trump is the devil, so we're almost <laughs> talking about the same thing. But that, that is the real issue. Ultimately what we have to recapture in America is a moral sense and a religious sense and without that it doesn't matter how good the economy is, eventually it's going to kill us. I want to follow up follow-up, and I mentioned this before the break, th there is this phenomenon that's been happening for a while, but we've seen two really high-profile examples of it in the last few weeks, which is uh, prominent religious leaders walking away from their faith. I would say one example, uh, wh while I don't think that it's fair to say that Pope Francis is not a religious man, I, I think that would, uh, that would be a, uh, an overstatement. He's certainly, not, he's certainly not a traditional Catholic in the way that John Paul II or Pope Benedict were. You, you move over into the evangelical world, you have two very high-profile uh, evangelical leaders over the last couple of weeks 
who've announced that they're walking away from their faith. One who wrote the book, uh, I Kiss Dating Goodbye, How I Kiss Dating Goodbye. Uh, another who is the worship leader for Hillsong, which is basically means the worship leader for the entire evangelical movement. Uh, because that's where almost all the evangelical music of the last you know, 15 or 20 years has come from. In, in Judaism, Ben, you write about this often and even talked about it tonight in reference to the president's comments about loyalty vis-a-vis uh, -vis Israel, that uh, the, the largest contingent, I think, at this point uh, of Jews in America are, are irreligious. They're, they're Jews ethnically, but they're not, uh, they don't participate right. in Judaism. Um, isn't that really the, the, the hollowing out of our religious institutions is happening right in front of us? What do we do about it? I, I, I just want to say, I think this is only half of the phenomenon. There's another uh, phenomenon going on, again, cursed with optimism, but still, there's another phenomenon going on where intellectuals are starting to realize that their default setting of materialism, relativism, and multiculturalism doesn't make any sense and has fallen apart. At the same time that these guys, guy, the Hillsong guy and this, uh, I think it's Joshua Harris is his name, yeah. who wrote the book about dating, uh, at the same time they were announcing they were losing their faith, uh, David Gerlinter from Yale, a, com a legendary computer science scientist, said that mathematically uh, evolution at the or as an origin of species didn't make sense, that there was no possible way that a new species could be created mathematically. The odds against it were so huge, and went on to say that intelligent design, while he wasn't embracing it, was a perfectly reasonable solution to the problem. So, so what I think we're seeing, what I think we're seeing falling apart is a simplistic Christianity. Uh, is falling apart while an intellectual Christianity is forming. And I know this to be true because I know a lot of the young uh, intellectuals <laughs> who are meeting together and reading the Gospels in, in, a, in a fresh way, not a new way. There's no new way to read the Gospels, but there are fresh ways and modern ways and intelligent ways uh, to read the Gospels. You know, the, the philosopher uh, Schopenhauer said that uh, Christianity had devolved into a, ban into a banal optimism. And I think that that's the problem. I think when you watch the Christian movies, like God is not dead, and when you listen to some of the Christian songs, you hear this banal optimism that actually doesn't describe the world. The, the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is a big event. It's a big thing. And when you, when you embrace it, you're not just telling other people how to have sex. That's not, I don't think that's what it's about. You're talking about an entire way of viewing the world. And as that way of viewing the world returns into the intellectual sphere, which I think it actually is doing as we speak, I think that's going to start to trickle down and refresh and reform Christianity in ways that are genuinely amazing. This has happened throughout history. It happened throughout the Middle Ages. It's happening again. You, you know. You had me at not telling people not to have sex, and because I, I actually sort of had this experience. I was cradle Catholic, I, we went to church sometimes, I fell away, I became an atheist at 13, and I fell away because I thought the religion was childish. I thought religion in general was childish. I read those stupid books by Christopher Hitchens and Richard Dawkins, which are geared exactly toward a 13-year-old boy who thinks he's smarter than he is. and. I, I rejected a faith that, that was childish, that was, uh, I, I think it was Niebuhr, the Protestant theologian, who said that it was uh, God without wrath leading a people without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of a Christ without a cross. It was childish, saccharine, sentimental religion with terrible songs from the 1970s and stupid felt banners, and I just didn't like it. And then, one thing I noticed when I got to college, everyone was an atheist and they were all pretty smart. But the smartest people were religious. And, and the very smartest people were very religious. Yeah, and I true. thought, oh my goodness, I've been lied to for 20 years. I think, I have the same hope you do. I think there is a growing movement of young people who approach religion with a fresh look and with seriousness, with sobriety. And they push away all that saccharine stuff. And they say, oh my gosh, there's something here that is good and true and beautiful. And you know, the other the thing... That The, 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 thing, the thing is that so many, so many of the problems that we face today are problems of wealth and success. 
You know, some, so many of the problems we face are problems of wealth and success. I mean, even if you look at the border, people want to come here because we're so successful. Uh, when you toss away, you know, there's an old Christian joke, I think it's a Christian joke, that uh, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Well, likewise, everybody wants to save the world, but nobody wants to be crucified. And I think that the idea that a, of a religion that takes away your pleasures, uh, that denies you certain uh, things that are so, so all spread out all before you like a feast, uh, is not that appealing to a group of people who live for 80, 90 years, who have good health, who have all this wealth, have all these comforts. And yet, and yet, there is something in the human heart that suffers without God. And you've written about this very eloquently. I I don't think religion has actually disappeared. I think it's just become leftism. I mean, this is a, a, a point right, that, that right, yeah. my friend Dennis Prager makes, right? We all know Dennis, and Dennis is constantly saying that the most successful religion of the 20th century is leftism. And he's, he's right about this, because yeah. people are searching for an identity that isn't just personal. They're searching for an identity in group. They're searching for an identity, them vis-a-vis -vis society. And people will fill that with politics. I think one of the reasons that we have seen politics turn into near religious warfare is because it basically has become religious warfare. There was a point at which religion was politics, right? Politics was just a bunch of religions fighting with each other. And then after the Peace of Westphalia, we basically said, okay, we're going to put all that aside and we're going to do our own thing on religion, but we'll have, a, we'll have a political sphere and we'll fight about policy. And now, as the common backdrop of religion, is falling away. People are reinvesting religious feeling into politics themselves. And so people are treating Democrat versus Republican like it's Protestant versus Catholic circa 1650. And that is really scary stuff. Right? I mean, and, and it's why you're seeing violence in the streets. It's why you're starting to see people treat each other in, in religious ways, right? People who are sinners and they must be cast out. And there is no repentance in the leftist version of religion. And people are looking for something that is more fulfilling and something that does require them to sacrifice. It you know, the, the, the lie that you can, I, I think that you're hitting on something and it's something that Jordan Peterson hits on too. Yep. Uh, and it's something that I think that, and I think that re religious people are fully cognizant of the sacrifice that is required by religion. Yep. Religious people who are truly religious are fully cognizant of the struggle of trying to discern a good benevolent God in a world that is rife with cruelty and malice. Right? Good religious people are dealing with these questions all the time. But the alternative to that is to not even face up to the question. It's to say that this is all random chance. It's to say that there is no system by which to live. And that is going to lead to a feeling of helplessness, of depression. It's going to make you feel as though you are not living in a world that you can navigate. Because that's not a world you can navigate. A chaotic world without any compass doesn't allow you to navigate those seas. It just means that you're going to die of scurvy somewhere out there. And so if you actually, if you actually want meaning, you're going to have to believe in a couple of fundamental concepts. And I think that a lot of people who are not religious agree with these fundamental concepts without understanding that they're religious in nature. The idea that the universe is ordered, that there are rules of cause and effect in the universe that make sense, that, that you can discern the way that life ought to be lived. Right? These are religious assumptions. These are not secularistic assumptions. And people feel that those assumptions are true even if they don't know that they're religious assumptions. So I am optimistic the that there will be a comeback here. The, mes the message that has been sent to us through, through history is so incredibly loud that only intellectuals could possibly not hear it. You and I both read this book uh, by Steven Pinker, uh, Enlightenment Now, in which he really excoriates the idea of God and talks about all the things that have been done, terrible things that have been done in the name of God, and there are terrible things that have been done in the name of God. And this is coming after a century in which the communists, openly rejecting God, slaughtered tens of millions of people after, after the Nazis rejecting God. I mean, the Nazis almost in this kind of morbid, hilari morbidly hilarious way, put Hitler where Jesus was supposed to be. They openly said, no, no, Christianity is just announcing the coming of Hitler. I'm sorry to laugh, but it's so crazy that it's almost funny. We had this century, half a century of absolute slaughter uh, in the rejection of Christianity and the rejection of God. And, you know, you talk about the Peace of Westphalia. The Peace of Westphalia came about because people said, we cannot do this as Christians. We can't slaughter each other as Christians. It goes against our religion. We must come up with a better way. All of these messages, are, it's as if God were writing on the sky with a gigantic purple finger. You know, you've got to believe in order to go forward. It is just now, it is just now occurring, occurring to intellectuals ah, you know, maybe we won't kill each other so much if we just embrace the faith of our fathers. And I think that that, that will come to pass. It will.
I want to get to a few more questions, but I, I wanted to say one thing on this, which is uh, my reaction to hearing the intersection of everything the three of you just said. Uh, question your own faith. Don't have a childish faith. You know, there, there's a New Testament idea of coming unto Christ in a childlike manner as a coming unto him as a child, but uh, that doesn't mean that you should be childish right, in right. your thinking. Uh, and we all give ourselves a lot of, we make a lot of excuses for ourselves. We can see all the silliness that people around. Like, it's easy for me to make fun of my Catholic friends and all their silly beliefs. A lot harder to reflect on. <laughs> so, well, easy. So, so, easy. Easy. so easy. So easy. And fun. <laughs> yeah. So difficult to reflect on the inconsistencies in my own viewpoint. I think one of the horrible things that conservatives did throughout the, the um, Christian coalition sort of moral majority 80s, 90s that really brought us to this moment is embracing saccharine Christianity, is not preparing our children, per, teaching our children that people will disagree with them and saying things like, oh, they'll hate you for Jesus' namesake, but not telling them they will also hate you if you're an asshole. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Not teaching, not teaching them the best arguments of your opposition. Right. And then as our friend Jonathan Hay, who produced the show tonight, did a great job, as he says, <laughs> as he says, when you, when you teach your children only uh, caricatures of the arguments against your own positions, yeah. you send them into battle not worse than unarmed. You send them into battle against mechanized armies with wooden swords painted silver and they think they are actually armed and then they and then they get out in the world and they hear actual smart arguments against what they believe and they crumble yep. and when they crumble they believe ah what my parents taught me is a lie because they led me like a sheep unto the slaughter you have to teach your children the best arguments that are going to be made against them which yep. means you have to have the the courage to confront the worst arguments that you believe and better yourself continually, even in your faith. And I would add one thing to that, which is, if you think you're going to win the country by keeping Donald Trump in office for four more years, or if you think you're gonna win the country by getting the Republicans back into control of uh, the Congress or keeping control of the Senate, if you think if we can get lower taxes or if we can build a wall that you're somehow going to lead to some sort of Edenic utopia, uh, and that we can arrive at success as a nation by hating our brothers and sisters, by hating our fellow citizens and somehow defeating them, you're missing the most important part of what we all believe, which is that the collective is only made better in this country when the individuals become better. Um, you should focus yourself amen. on improving you. This goes to a, a, a question of, of something that I feel has corrupted our conversation, which is the, the fact that we can communicate around the world so easily has destroyed localism. It's destroyed the idea that really solutions are created by individuals in, in uh, action with other individuals. And I think we always come up with these ideas that are supposed to solve all the problems of the world. Like, try being nice to the guy next to you. you yeah, know? That's right. try, try, try doing the thing that needs to be done in your neighborhood. Try lifting the guy up who's beside you. Try having True. an argument with somebody True. without cursing his name. Look who's sitting next to me. I, well, oh, not you. <laughs> I didn't mean you. I mean, come on. This is actually true. I think that, like, sometimes, I know Christians in particular sometimes are like, we've got to send a lot of money to Africa. And look, people in Africa need a lot of help. A lot, of, a lot of bad, poor, third world countries around the world. But I think that it's kind of a cop out half the time that we want to help people who we will never have to meet mm -hmm. because they aren't real to us. And the people who we're actually in a position to do the most good for, we know them and we know their flaws and we don't like them very much. Right. And so it's a cop out to go, eh, just send it to the third world instead of going, no, I actually have to like all the people who disagree well, with me. This is the big dichotomy and you see it, I mean, everyone does it, but you see it especially on the left which is that the left loves humanity. They really do, they love humanity. And they detest humans. I know this because I look at my Twitter mentions. I know this right. because I go to these, and I will talk to people that I've just met, leftists, I mean, you get this all the time, we all do. And they'll scream at you like you're not a fellow human being. And you just think, gosh, if you put, put just one hundredth of the, the vitriol, if you took that vitriol that you have for me and put that into a little bit of kindness, maybe you would be able to affect your grand vision to all of humanity if you could be nice to like one <laughs> single human being.
It's hard to hear them clap for him. I'll admit. <laughs> <laughs> I want to do something we've never done before. I want to do a 10 question lightning round. Okay. Okay. I'm going to have Alicia ask 10 questions. Alicia, if you would aim each question at just one member of the panel, okay. and we're going to keep our answers concise. One, two, three sentences top. And unless somebody misses something that we can't allow to stand, or says something that we can't allow to stand, we're going to keep it to a one person answer per question. Number one. All right, this is interesting. Back to the parenting thing. This is a white middle-aged woman here in the audience with her 18-year-old son. She's been concerned about his mostly liberal views, most of which come from his public school system. What bits of wisdom can you impart to him? P.S. She's very glad that he came tonight and she thinks it's a step in the right, no pun intended, direction. <laughs> okay, so so first of all, mom, nothing really helps your son become more conservative like a public shaming. <laughs> <laughs> but the answer, of course, is that, uh, as, as I always recommend on my podcast, and folks on Pod Save America never will, you should listen to my podcast, then you should listen to Pod Save America, you should read our website over at Daily Wire, and then you should go check out Huffington Post. You should examine all of the arguments, you should. You should examine all of the arguments and then recognize that the other guy's arguments are wrong. The, 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 <laughs> That's right. That really is the, the, the reason the education system sucks is because they don't present all of the arguments. They just present you the left-wing version of American history and then suggest there is no other version of American history. I'll clap for you. Number two. I feel like this one should go to Michael Knowles. Uh, someone wants to know, are you going to raid Area 51 on September 20th? <laughs> <laughs> oh, please do. <laughs> Listen, we have 3,000 illegal aliens coming over every single day, and we pretend that that's a problem. <laughs> Who knows how many aliens we have at Area 51 for the last 50 years? I'm going. Andrew, Three. Andrew Clavin, please name a Democrat in today's climate whose views you respect. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, I'm, I'm stumped. I, you know, <laughs> I haven't got it. You know, they always, they always say that there are these guys, these middle of the road guys, uh, who are the majority of the Democrat Party, and I never see any of them. I never see anybody who comes out how about, and says. How about Kristen Cinema? <laughs> 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 Senator of Arizona. She's yeah, no, no. Not there, there are the, there are these people who are buried within the uh, Congress who actually do have uh, middle of the road views, but you never see them because they vote with Nancy Pelosi. They vote, you know, with I'll, the Democrats. I'll give you a weird answer. I actually have respect for Andrew Yang's views. I don't agree with them, but, but I, I respect yeah. that he's the only guy having any ideas on the left you right know, now. The, the, problem, the problem with Andrew Yang is he's the civilized version of a very uncivilized solution, which is pay people to go away. And I, I, <laughs> I, cannot, I cannot agree with that at all. And I think he's, look, I think he's a good person. And I think you're reacting to that, and he is a good person and a decent guy. But I think that this is the problem. We cannot abandon the meaning. We cannot abandon ordinary people having a meaning to their lives. We cannot pay them to not have a meaning to their lives. You know? Four. God King. Other than Frito. <laughs> or is it Fredo? Fredo. Fredo. I, I don't know. I'm from Oklahoma. Hey. That's our word, okay? <laughs> That's it's our like word. It's like the N word, right? I'm not allowed to say it. It's, you can't say it. Okay. Unless you're Italian or something. Okay. I don't know. Who is your favorite character from The Godfather? <laughs> mm. I can't, honestly, I cannot answer the question. Like, I, I am not a. Um, I'm not one of these guys who's watched The Godfather 48 times since Christmas. I like, I love The Godfather. I think it's a, a great film a and an even better sequel. Uh, th there's nothing more entertaining than any movie with a 17 minute live action wedding that just takes place right in the middle of the, <laughs> it's riveting stuff. Uh, but I, I'm not one who's like completely chopped apart The Godfather and, and can really- Ask Drew then, because this is Drew's question. Yeah, I, I mean, my, my favorite character in The Godfather is Don Corleone, is the Marlon Brando character, because, because he actually represents some kind of old fashioned idea of morals. I do have to point out about Fredo though. I just want to say one thing about Fredo. I gotta, I gotta say this, I, I have to say this. Fredo is the son of a guy who rose from nothing to become 
very powerful. He is the brother of a guy who took the place of the father, who became very powerful. He is Chris Cuomo. <laughs> Five. Ben, you give Michael a lot of, I think, necessary crap, but somebody in the audience wants to know, can you find one nice thing? Ah. Ah, oh, yes, nice somebody thing. named Michael in the audience <laughs> wants to know. You know. <laughs> to say about it. God commands us in the Bible <laughs> to love each and every human being, to love our neighbor as ourselves. Since that's impossible, <laughs> all I can say about Michael Moles is I'm just grateful that I don't have to be in the room when he changes outfits for his show. That is, he's known around the, I understand, I'm not answering the question. Hey, around the office, he is mostly known for, we have a separate room for changing, for just changing in the middle of the office, for no reason at all, like Harvey Weinstein would. Yeah. <laughs> you see Alicia nodding over there, Alicia no, knows. No, like, seri for serious, I was doing hair and makeup earlier, and my husband witnessed this. <laughs> Wait, hold on. You're saying you were in the changing room earlier? So, where people hair and hair. makeup. All this brings me to the one thing that I can say that's nice about Michael Moles. He has the proper number of human nipples. <laughs> Prove it. Prove it, he says. Wow, that's, that's pretty nice. Six. I think that is technically a compliment. That's enough. Six. Ben has cold feet. Michael has two nipples. This is no. Who said he had two nipples? He said he has the proper number. He didn't say it was two. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. You non Jews have two nipples? <laughs> 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 oh my gosh. This is, I think this is a good one for the God King. Born and raised in LA, but I'm thinking of moving out of the state. What are your thoughts? Stay and fight or move on? It's like our conversation every single day. <laughs> yeah, Ben and I talked about this on the drive down here and every other time we're in a car together. Listen, it's quite difficult. This is where the action is. The Daily Wire wouldn't be what it is if we weren't in L.A. The fact that we're in enemy-occupied territory forces us to make our argument sharp. It forces, it forces us to have a sense of humor. It forces us to know ourselves. It forces us to build good relationships. It forces us to learn and continue to learn. It also costs us just a crap ton of money in taxes. <laughs> And it, it makes it very difficult to operate a business. I guess the one thing that I would say is, uh, I do believe in moving. I think that one of the mistakes that's being made on the left and the right today is this belief that if the factory shuts down, we have to come where you are and build a life for you. But the history of the American experiment, the history of America is that people left the old world and they traveled at great risk to themselves across the sea. And then they left the East Coast and they traveled across the Appalachians. And then they traveled to California during the gold rush. And then they traveled uh, back uh, into Texas and some of those areas as, as recently as like my hometown was founded in 1912. Uh, very, very recently in a place that the Comanche called the place where no one lived. And we proved them wrong because we now live there. Um, <laughs> like 200 people, but. Yeah, it's not many of us, but we're rigorous. Uh, it, I think that it is important that you be daring. It is important that you take risk. And if that means you have to get up and go, then you need to get up and go. If that means that you need to leave your job and create something new, maybe you'll fall on your face. But there, there, what's the point of living in the land of opportunity if you don't take any opportunities when they're put in front of you? The, the one piece of caution I would give, though, is this. There, there is a need for good people to be here fighting the fight. It's also important, if you leave here because you don't like the taxes and the regulation, and you go to my home state of Texas, for God's sakes, don't vote to raise the taxes and increase the regulation. <laughs> Seven. Vote for president! 2024, baby. Andrew, 
Can universal basic income ever work? No. <laughs> that was easy. No, no it's, it's ridiculous. The whole thought of it is ridiculous. Look, work is changing. There's no question about it. We've, go, we've been through something that was just as violent and chaotic and traumatic as the Industrial Revolution. We're still going through it. The technological revolution has made, uh, has made localism difficult. It's made federalism difficult. It's made nationalism difficult. It has made globalism a, a de facto uh, state of mind. To just say to people, you're done, here's some money, go away, is insane. It is basically writing off the vast number of human beings who have something to offer, every single one of them. Every single one of them is a child of God with something to do, something, and, 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 and the whole point of capitalism is if there's something that you can do, you can make money off it. We don't have to offer you some kind of income to go away. I think we have to create worlds and think up worlds and, and not do it through government regulation. We do it through creativity, where you create worlds where there is work for everybody to do. And I don't believe that's impossible in any, by any stretch of the imagination. Eight. <laughs> Michael, when do you think we can start packing for Greenland? <laughs> I can't wait. I think Greenland is a great idea. Everybody joked about it when it happened. It's one of Trump's best ideas. First of all, it's always good to buy land because God ain't making any more of it. <laughs> the United States has always done very well on real estate. The Louisiana Purchase uh, did, did us very well. Uh, getting Texas was pretty good. Getting California was pretty good. Buying Alaska has done us very well. Also, we've tried to buy Greenland now for well over 100 years. Andrew Johnson looked into buying Greenland. Uh, uh, Harry Truman actually tried to buy it for $100 million, but he wasn't the art of the deal kind of guy, so he didn't really know <laughs> how to make that deal happen. And, and President Trump, what he does because he's this media genius, is he says something, and just because he says it, people laugh. You know, he's just a funny guy who knows that. However, the idea has been floated for a very long time. I want to do it. I can't wait to go. It sounds like the Danes don't want to sell. Who cares? Since when do we care what the Danes think? It, <laughs> Greenland is a, a really good opportunity. Mike Pompeo, Secretary of State, said it's a good opportunity because it's sort of like a win-win. I'm not that worried about cl climate change killing us all in the next five minutes or whatever AOC says it is. But if it does, it, it, as Mike Pompeo pointed out, it will open up a lot of Arctic sea lanes. It could reduce the amount of time that we can get goods and services over to Asia by about 20 days. He says it could be the Suez or Panama Canal of the 21st century. It's a great military base. We're launching Space Force. I want to go to Greenland. Not because it is easy, but because it is hard. So Michael, I have a plan to send you to Greenland. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you might, did you whisper to Trump? Is that how we got this in the first place? And who's going to stop us, the Little Mermaid? I mean, we have nothing. <laughs> uh, one of our employees, Matt Gerard, said uh, on Twitter, I think the greatest plan that Trump should actually employ, which is that we should rename uh, Hawaii Greenerland. <laughs> <laughs> and then we should rename Alaska Greenestland. <laughs> And then the value of Greenland will just plummet. We can buy it for pennies on the dollar. Nine. For God's sakes, nine. Well, our plan to send Michael to take Sarah Huckabee Sanders' job didn't work, but ambassador to Greenland. Governor of Greenland. Yeah. Governor Something. of Greenland. Knowles. It's pretty good. I'm Dion of Greenland. <laughs> Court jester. Of Peasant to Greenland. <laughs> Question nine. As conservatives, how worried should we be about the electoral map when states like Texas and Arizona seem to be turning blue? Ben. Super duper 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 worried. <laughs> like really worried. Uh, so I, I know a lot of folks in both the Texas Republican Party as well as in the Arizona Republican Party. And Arizona, Martha McSally losing that senatorial race to Kirsten Sinema despite the fact that there were all these comments that Cinema had made that were truly anti-American. I mean, really awful comments. Uh, and then yeah. she won, and now she is smart enough to be governing as moderate. That is a bad sign for Arizona. Uh, the, the Texas, Texas isn't gonna be blue in the next election cycle. Trump will win Texas, but it is trending in the wrong direction. Mitt Romney won the state by 12 points. Trump won the state by six points. Cruz won the state by two points. There were four 
Republicans in Texas who have already retired going into the 2020 cycle. Yeah. They lost 14 House legislative seats in the last legislative elections. Uh, they lost a bunch of judicial seats because a lot of judicial, judicial seats in Texas are elected. And the, the suburbs are turning purple and the cities are blue already. Dallas is blue, Austin is blue, Houston is blue. It's, it, Texas is, is a mirror of the rest of the country in the sense that all of the urban areas are extraordinarily blue, all the suburbs are beginning to turn purple, and the rural areas are very red. But people are overestimating the amount of population in Texas that lives in the rural areas. Yeah. They're getting the math wrong. And the same thing is true in Arizona. Now, if you lose Texas, Republicans basically never win another election, obviously. So it's, it's a real disaster, and it's one of the reasons why banking on the same base that got him there for Trump is not a victorious strategy for Republicans in the long run. You do need to grow the base. I mean, you do need to reach into new audiences. I think Trump is trying to do this in certain ways, but I think that he's actually trying to pick some of the hardest fruit off the tree, right? You're starting to see him carve into, for example, the African-American vote share. Well, that's kind of a hard vote share to cut into. I'll give you an easier vote share to cut into. White college-educated women who Mitt Romney won in 2012 and with whom Donald Trump performed fairly decently in, in 2016. He also performed great among white high school educated women. They are now voting in minority, according to the polls, for him. So yeah, the Trump's, the, the, the Republican Party is tied to whoever is the president, just as the Democratic Party was tied to whoever is the president. That doesn't mean it's a long-term irreversible trend. It does mean that, of course, people should be worried deeply about Texas and Arizona. It would be foolhardy to, to say otherwise. And I don't mean to be a downer, but you no, know, I, I, it, that's I, the election I, analysis. I think you're right, but I, I don't agree with you about African-Americans. I think African-Americans are winnable. Uh, they're, you know, they're, they're people, <laughs> just, like, <laughs> just like everybody else. They, I'm not saying they, they're not winnable. I'm saying that they are not the most obvious It's easier not area. to lose the people who voted for you last time well, right, exactly. the people well, who Well, no, no question. But you Criminal know, justice reform is not going to pick up 10% of the black vote. You know what's interesting is that the union uh, people are, are going with Trump. The union people are showing up for the Democrat uh, candidates, but they're not applauding the way they used to. The union leaders are staying in their seats when everybody else is leaping to their feet. I mean, Trump has re reestablished the manufacturing base in this country, and the unions are noticing it. I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of good he stuff. Did, I mean, he, he did very well among those voters in 2016. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the problem again is moving forward. How do you expand those bases? Question number ten. Question number ten. I think I want all of y'all to answer. Okay. Which is the number one absolute bestest Star Wars movie? Oh. Is the, this it's the only, easiest, yeah, the easiest question, question in the world? Right? Phantom Menace, right? <laughs> now that's pod racing. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course it's Empire, Empire Strikes of course, Back. Empire. Come on. Of course, of course it's Empire Strikes Back. Okay, and also all of them, all the new ones are an abomination. They're an abomination. The Last Jedi is an abomination. The Force Awakens, despite Jeremy's best efforts to pretend that J.J. Abrams is an A-list director, The Force <laughs> Awakens is a disappointment. When Ben it's says all the new ones are a disaster, he means starting with Return of the Jedi. <laughs> 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 Listen, there's 3,000 of you, and you made this a badass night for us. Thank you. Thank you.